that so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleam, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous flight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streamed. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled Wow, that was Erica Lopez uh, with a beautiful rendition of the national anthem. Erica is an undergrad at University of Redlands and a lacrosse player. So my name is Anja Rastogi and um, my privilege to be the host today for the event with one of my very good friends, Mr. Philip Palmer. I also want to welcome everybody to, on behalf of UCLA Health and also the UCLA Core Kidney Program to the Kidney Fair today. So this is our sixth fair. The first one was 2015. And the first five were at the beach. Every year, we went to Santa Monica Beach and had a lot of fun. And that's why it was called a fair. There was entertainment and there was education at the same time. But because of the circumstances this year, we couldn't do it at the beach. Well, OK, uh, that won't stop us. And we went forward with the virtual program. So here we are, the virtual event. Now. Being at the beach is a lot of fun, but one advantage of the being on a virtual program is it's global. So finally, there is a program that, that anybody can join from, from every part of the world. So this event is, is being attended by every continent except Antarctica. That's, that's quite spectacular. And also, we... In, in this event, there is going to be a lot of panel discussions in which we'll be going over some key aspects about kidney disease and also about, about healthcare in general. But there will also be a lot of very powerful patient stories. And behind each patient story, there's actually a message. And, and we'll try to drive that home. We also want to share some resources that our patients with kidney disease have. So, so with that, um, I would like to introduce my, my co-host, Mr. Philip Palmer. Mr. Philip Palmer is the news anchor, and probably a lot of you know, for ABC7. But what probably a lot of you don't know is he's an incredible human being. And, and he has done so much for patient care and outreach. So with that, Mr. Palmer. Well, Dr. Rostogi, one of the reasons I did this is I was going to try to get my audience into Antarctica. And now that I found out that we're not in Antarctica, I'm a little disappointed. <laughs> but I think I'm going to let you do more of the work today. Uh, but yeah, this is, a, I hope you guys understand um, these times are incredibly trying. We have been throughout the morning wearing our masks. Uh, you and I normally uh, greet each other much more warmly. Uh, and unfortunately, we're not able to do that right now. Uh, but thanks very much for letting me be a part of this. Um, there will be times, as you know, that throughout this day, trying something so new and so different, um, we might make a mistake here or there. We hope that you'll bear with us as we try to get everybody together. But this event, this mission, uh, Core Kidney, is just too important to not take a year uh, to talk about it. We can't take a year off because, by the way, you and I have had this discussion. Kidney disease continues to happen. Um, COVID is happening, but so is kidney, so is lungs, so is heart, so is their medicine continues. And so the work is too powerful for us uh, to not uh, get going. We have some of the world's leading experts live with us. Uh, we're Zooming. Just like everybody else, we're going to talk about kidney research. We're going to share stories, uh, patients and donors, and we're going to learn about how medicine is being affected with COVID-19. And then you are wanting to talk a little bit about how medicine is changing in Change. general. Right. Yes. 
So, uh, Mr. Palmer, first of all, thank you so much for being a part of this. I mean, like I said, last year we it, had it at the beach, and it was wonderful, it was beautiful. It was hotter there than here, yeah. so <laughs> I think getting to the studio is a little easier. Yes. So, now, let's talk about uh, something that's very dear to my heart. You know, this is UCLA uh, education, and, and brewing beans is, is, is a big part of, of what we do. And what is brewing beans? I think that question uh, really comes up. So Brewing Beans is an undergraduate program at UCLA, and, and Erica, who sang the national anthem, is actually part of that. And, and the purpose of, of the Brewing Beans is to actually train the future leaders in healthcare, whether it be MDs, nurses, researchers, and we have a whole club. And some of them, those stories you'll be hearing uh, during this event. Now, we, we do have some runners um, at, on campus. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they're gearing up. So we have a, what we call a spirit walk, the 2K run and the 5K run. So we'll try to get them in. I think there's a bit of delay getting those videos. Well, we have some of the video of the broom beans ready to go. Yeah. And, and, and when we wrap up today, that's when they're actually going to do their 2K because this is a fundraising effort. Uh, we are not going to be bashful about trying to raise money. That is our mission. We want to raise awareness. We want to raise money. Uh, and by the way, as you watch this today, there will be links at the bottom where you can get information from some of the panelists. You can find out more information about kidney disease. And you can also find a way to help us raise money, which is, again, one of the most important things we're going to do today. Uh, a lot of people supporting the event, uh, the work for kidney uh, disease research, uh, treatment, it's, it's all right there for you. And we have uh, that information in those handout panels that I was just mentioning. Um, as you watch, you can click on that folder that's at the bottom, still hear what's going on, right. And those links will also be available for up to a year. So right. a year after today, May 17th of next year. So you can always come back to this site. You can watch it again, because I know that you're going to want to watch all of this twice. Um, but you can find all of the links and the information on that site as well. But now I think we want to talk to one of our panels, right? Yes. So our first panel, and it's really my pri privilege and honor to introduce the three panelists. Number one is Dr. Eve Glazier. She is the president of the faculty practice group. Uh, Dr. Dan Uslan, very relevant, um, always relevant, but even more today, the Clinical Chief of Infectious Diseases at UCLA Health. And then we have Dr. Michael Pfeffer, also very relevant, um, the Chief Informatics Officer at UCLA Health. And th in this day and age, telehealth and an electronic healthcare system is, is quite important. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Eve Glazier. To, to give a bit of an intro and what UCLA Health is doing about COVID-19. Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm actually going to hand that over to Dan and then I'll, I'll speak third after Dr. Pfeffer. Go ahead, Dan. Thank you, um, Andre. Thank you for the introduction. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Sure. Thank you so much for making time to uh, be with us today. And thank you, Dr. Rostogi, for the kind invitation. Uh, so my specialty is infectious diseases. And pretty much for the last four months, uh, all we've been working on in our, our specialty is, of course, COVID-19. Uh, as you all know, COVID-19 is a infection that has profoundly changed not only uh, our day-to-day -day lives, uh, how we go grocery shopping, how we do our dry cleaning, how we go to work, but certainly for those of us who work in healthcare has resulted in how we uh, practice infection prevention in the hospital. So there's a couple things I wanted to share with you all today. Uh, first of all is a brief overview of COVID-19. Uh, I also wanna briefly speak about how it affects uh, those of you living with uh, kidney disease. Uh, and in particular, I wanna talk briefly about testing for COVID-19 because in, in um, um, in, in my discussions with patients, that's one of the areas that perhaps is the most confusing. So uh, as of today, there's approximately 1.5 million cases of COVID-19 in the United States, and there's been almost 90,000 deaths, which is just absolutely staggering and, and heartbreaking. Uh, COVID-19, as you may know, is a uh, infection due to a virus called a coronavirus. There are several different coronaviruses, uh, in fact, we typically get them pretty much every year because they're one of the viruses that cause the common cold. This one is obviously different. It's different than the regular common cold type viruses that we all get year after year. A PCR test tells you if you have COVID right now, and an antibody test tells you if you had it in the past. 
What I want to caution you all about, though, and this is very important to understand, the antibody test needs to be interpreted very carefully. And there are a couple of reasons for that. First of all, like any test that we do in medicine, no test is perfect. And the antibody test can sometimes cross react. And what that means is it can sometimes tell you that you've had COVID-19 when you didn't actually have it. We call that a false positive. It can sometimes be false negative, meaning it says you never had it, but you actually did. And the worry is, is that if you get that uh, test result back and it says, yes, you had COVID-19 and you didn't actually have it and it's a false positive test, that could be dangerous because if you use that information from that test to either say, oh, that's great. I had it already. I don't need to take any precautions anymore. I don't need to wear a mask. I don't need to wash my hands. I can go back to my normal life. And it was a false positive test, then that could be dangerous. The second thing that's important is that we actually don't know how long the antibodies from COVID-19 last for. It may be that they last for life, like something like measles. Or it may be that after one or two years, they start to fade and you're no longer protected anymore. So again, if you start to relax the physical distancing or the use of masks or any of those types of things in response to knowing that you have a positive antibody, that potentially could be dangerous as well. So uh, I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your time. I hope everybody stays healthy and safe and uh, uh, enjoy the rest of the fair. Well, we try to get Dr. Pfeffer on air. I'll just take a moment um, and say good morning to everybody. I'm so thrilled to join this incredible event. I really appreciate the opportunity to comment briefly on keeping ourselves healthy and why it's so important to prioritize your routine and preventative health care. As you know, since late March, due to this pandemic, the CDC has recommended the delay of routine and elective visits to both mitigate the spread of the virus and also preserve protective equipment like masks and gowns. And as you well know, our state, our local governments have worked together to mandate stay-at-home orders to support the flattening of the curve. This deferral of preventative healthcare services has been essential and quite effective, really, in, in preventing a surge and preserving what we call PPE but it now poses a serious public health impact and then that's important to address as soon as practicable it's completely understandable that there's fear and confusion about going to the doctor and really any healthcare facility right now but unfortunately there's also growing evidence that patients aren't getting important screenings and checkups as an example vaccine administration to children has dropped about 70 percent and screening for breast cancer, colon cancer, and cervical cancer has dropped almost above 90% wow. respectively in March compar compared to pre-COVID averages. And this lack of preventative care puts us all at much greater increased risk for other medical conditions and even other infectious diseases. We've got major concerns that without resuming routine preventative health care that we're gonna might see higher disease incidence and later disease stage, a time of diagnosis in the months to come if our preventative screening rates continue to be so low. So all this comes to a very important focus of navigating life with COVID, and I would emphasize even thriving with COVID, is going to be the thoughtful and careful resuming and prioritizing of routine and preventative health care. And by that, I mean pr primary care, behavioral health, labs, radiology, pharmacy, dental services, and of course, specialty care for chronic medical conditions like kidney disease. So first and foremost, because I think we're all looking for, for guidelines, I really want to strongly encourage all of you that the first person that you turn to for definitive guidance is your primary care physician and or that specialist that's most relevant to you. And perhaps that's your amazing nephrologist like Dr. Rostogi. But they're going to be the best advisor to recommend what screenings and care you might need and are most important for you when and how to obtain that care, you know, especially within the context of your own individual risk profile, all balanced by the need to comply with state and city regulations and rules. I just wanted to give a brief word since this is UCLA Health about how we're approaching routine care. We've been working across the entire health system to create a really safe environment for our patients, um, not just for our patients to receive care, but importantly, also for our staff and providers to provide that care in. Um, we have more than 180 medical practices. Um, our procedure units are open and obviously our hospitals, but we're following the most rigorous infection prevention policies, including universal masking, pre-screening protocols and physical distancing protocols. And we're exploring every um, iteration of, of revamping the clinic that you can think of, um, adjusting schedules, rooming processes, waiting room and exam rooms really to optimize our ability to allow for that 
essential physical distancing and steadfastly using appropriate um, and recommended PPE. So my real message is not only do I think it's safe for our patients to come in and receive essential and routine preventative care, I highly, and we at UCLA highly encourage that you do. Um, as many of you likely know, and Dr. Pfeffer um, will hopefully be talking about this momentarily, um, there's a lot of visits that can be safely done and effectively done through video visits and telephone calls. So again, really recommend that you touch base with your doctor to determine the type of visit that's best for you. Um, lastly, it is so important to find joy and purpose in the present. Uh, it's also important to commit to the future, and a wonderful way of doing that is to keep yourselves healthy and preserve our human connection. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Rostogi, and everyone at the Core Kidney Program. Um, please enjoy the rest of this program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Glazier. Thank you very much. And then we have Dr. Pfeffer, last but not the least. Hi, Dr. Rostogi. Can you hear me okay? Yep, yep. Okay, wonderful. Absolutely, well, I, Dr. Pfeffer. It, it's a real honor to join Dr. Glazier and Dr. Uslan on the first panel. And, and I am absolutely thrilled to be part of the first virtual UCLA core kidney fair. And no doubt, what better way to celebrate a virtual kidney fair than to talk about telehealth. So telehealth is the term that describes all types of virtual ways to connect with your healthcare providers. And that includes things like video visits. While it does not replace the need for in-person visits with your physician, it certainly can augment the way patients and providers interact. The COVID-19 pandemic has clearly accelerated the use of telehealth and particularly video visits around the globe. I'd love to share with you some statistics from UCLA Health about our televisits. If you look at February of this year, we did about 1,000 telehealth visits. And we, uh, when we talk about telehealth visits, we include video visits, uh, telephone visits, and e-consults. Contrast that with April of this year, we did 80,000 telehealth visits amongst uh, over 2,000 providers. And what's amazing is we had um, less than 0.5% uh, no-show rate. So, you know, not having to get into the car and drive into the uh, clinic and fight traffic, especially in Los Angeles, uh, this statistic is, is, I think, really important about that. We've had telehealth visits across all age ranges. And when we survey our patients, 91% of them strongly agree or agree that they were satisfied with their video visit and 83% strongly agree or agree with wanting to have a future video visit uh, in, in, uh, in addition to coming in uh, person at a later time. We're expanding our telehealth capabilities to inpatient, um, skilled nursing facilities, the emergency room, and basically anywhere where we need to take care of our patients. Telehealth is certainly here to stay, and I am very excited about the limitless possibilities of this technology to improve health across the globe. The other thing I would just wanna mention briefly is around uh, data. There's incredible power in the data collected in the electronic health record. It allows us to better care for our patients across the care continuum by identifying patients that need our help sooner, reaching out to those that require health maintenance exams and tests, and provide physicians with key pieces of information to get the best care for their patients. In addition, it allows our researchers to analyze the data for insights that would only be gleaned from large data sets and potentially lead to predictive models and precision medicine that will significantly improve care for populations around the world. So technology, whether for data analytics or telehealth, has the power to transform medicine and improve health in partnership with care providers, researchers, and educators. Thank you again for allowing me to take part in this incredible kidney fair and the global reach it has. I'll turn it back over to uh, Dr. Risto. Dr. Pfeffer, that was outstanding. And, and all of you, all three of you, I'm, first of all, I want to thank all three of you because I know how busy you are um, with this COVID-19. But there's a couple of things I do want to mention. Dr. Glacier, uh, your point about, about checkups, routine checkups, so relevant. And, and one of the points that we keep on reinforcing with our kidney patients, if you look at the data, um, the, the prevalence of kidney disease is one in seven U.S. adults have kidney problems. 
But what's mm -hmm. even more interesting is nine out of 10 don't know. And this is straight from CDC today. I just checked it on, on their website. One in three patients who end up on dialysis um, have never seen a nephrologist. Why is that? Because it's a silent disease. And, and for that, routine checkups are very important. So I think just, just to reinforce your point, Dr. Glacier, I think we can't fall behind in vaccinations. We can't fall behind in routine checkup. Just because you're feeling okay does not mean that you might be okay. It could be diabetes. You know, it could be heart disease. So, so very, very relevant. And Dr. Pfeffer, uh, just going back to 2013, I still remember when we rolled out the electronic health care, and, and we had a conversation right before that. Um, it was amazing, uh, almost completely seamless. And now it's 2020, and we are doing these, these televisits. So extremely grateful to all three of you. And Dr. Uslan, um, thank you very much. I know you, I don't know, you're even sleeping these days, but, but I, I, we truly value your guidance um, for UCL Health. I mean, I truly do that. And thank you very, very much, all three of you. Um, and with that, um, we'll go back to... Um, well, we'll just, we'll keep going. Okay. Because you know what? I have some yes, things that I want to say new, yeah, uh, hello. regarding uh, everything yeah. that the, 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 the panelists were saying. And I challenge people, because yeah. one of the things that you've said, many times people with kidney disease don't know they're sick. Right. And so you can't just sit at home and rub some dirt on it because you're afraid to go to a doctor right now. UCLA Health is making great strides. Yeah. Almost, it, it seems like the healthcare system across uh, the country and the world are basically running two hospitals now. You have a COVID hospital and then you have a hospital for other things. Yes. You need to understand that measures are being taken to protect your health, right. whether it's kidney disease or another disease. Right. You are being protected. Call your doctor, yeah. get familiar with telemedicine, see how it might benefit you because one of the things that you said is you have patients from outside of the state, right. outside of the city. Telemedicine offers them an opportunity yeah. to very easily get in touch with you, come to see you, visit you, and if you have a problem, telemedicine with your doctor and find out what their protocol is for once you go visit. So you need to get comfortable with going to the doctor because things, we have a new normal now. We have a new normal now. Uh, one of the things that we're also finding striking today is that it's international. It's just not just local. And, and you're talking about a friend of yours from one of the many continents and the countries that we're talking about today. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is about Mumbai, I believe. Yes. And actually, uh, we'll go first to Dr. Sharma from Jaipur. Oh, okay. So um, we have, all right, see. And I think that's in the queue, if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Sharma. Hello, everyone, and warm greetings from India. I am Dr. Anita from SMS Medical College, Jaipur. We are in a time period where all the nations are called upon to choose between what is right and what is easy along with the twin responsibility of saving lives and livelihood. Challenges faced in this pandemic are unique to each geographical location. For us, it was dense population and paucity of space at homes, making social distancing difficult. The management strategies of the local administration was based on multi-pronged approach for highly dense areas, which included geographical quarantine by physical barriers, ensuring door-to-door -door delivery of daily necessities, sampling of potential super spreaders like vegetable vendors and milk distributors, sanitization and creating awareness. The current COVID crisis is like a wake up call for all governments and administrations for rapid expansion of quality healthcare infrastructure in light of warnings that more such contagions must be coming. We also realized that even though lockdown plays a critical role by slowing the spread. It cannot be a substitute for a robust healthcare system. I sincerely believe human spirit and mankind will certainly emerge as a winner from this crisis. Namaste and all the very best. Namaste to everyone. I'm Dr. Shalini and I'm speaking to you from Mumbai, India. I work in a COVID ICU here in Mumbai and the number of cases in India are also exorbitantly high. But a majority of people are getting better and going home to their loved ones. This does not take away from the seriousness of the situation the world is in at the moment. And I wish everyone would follow all the precautions which have been advised. One of the words which is being used a lot is social distancing, which I prefer to call as physical distancing. We should stay connected with our family and friends all the time. 
but physical distancing is a privilege in india and especially for mumbai mumbai has a population of 18 million people which is almost equivalent to that of the entire state of new york so the learning message from india is that people should work from home and stay at home as much as possible so that the country can recover soon enough i applaud the ucla core kidney program team for this great initiative of holding a virtual fair the global pandemic needs the whole world to come together especially in pooling all their resources staying emotionally connected and trying to make the world better as soon as possible so hooray again for the ucla core kidney program and all of you be safe and take care of yourself thank you so much and bye bye from my side thank you thank you so much um so dr anita sharma is an OBGYN specialist from Jaipur, my hometown in India, actually. And Dr. Narula is a neurointensivist in Mumbai. And the, the significance of Mumbai is it's like New York City, uh, just bigger. And uh, we know what happened in New York City. So, so thank you so much for sharing. And I do agree. I think that's a term that was also used by, by our previous panel, um, that it should be physical distancing and not social distancing. And I think that's quite relevant. If anything, things are closer now because of the pandemic. I've reached out to my friends that I've not spoken to in ages. So uh, with that, I think we have our next video uh, coming up. And this is Dr. Manisha Mathur from Singapore. Hey, everyone, and a hello from Singapore. My name is Dr. Manisha Mathur. And I'm one of the senior consultants and an OBGYN specialist working in KK Women's and Children's Hospital, which is the largest maternity unit in Singapore. Due to the geographical proximity of Singapore to China, we were affected by the COVID pandemic pretty early on, and we recorded our first case on 21st of January 2019. On 7th of February, we upgraded our TROSCON level, a system which indicates increasing disease severity from a yellow to an orange indicating that the disease was now severe and there was a possibility of person-to-person -person spread. So now, for over three months, our healthcare workers have been battling the COVID pandemic, working very hard and have been under tremendous pressure. Just when we thought things were getting better, we've had a second surge of COVID positive cases and we have now identified the negative impact of COVID-19 on the mental well-being of our healthcare professionals. We have recognized this and we've put in place a number of measures and focused initiatives to protect our healthcare individuals' mental well-being. I think this is of vital importance when battling a long-haul pandemic. I would like to thank UCLA Core Kidney Foundation for, give, for giving me an opportunity to connect with everyone. Although we have a long way to go to overcome this crisis, I believe we can get through this wiser and strongest as we are all in this together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mathur. Um, that was Dr. Manisha Mathur from, from Singapore. As you probably know, um, Singapore did a pretty good job in, in um, you know, making sure the infections don't, don't happen or spread. But now they're reopening, so, so they might be. And that's something that we in the US need to keep an eye on that as well. Um, and Dr. Mathur is an OBGYN specialist. Now, after this, so we had our first panel discussion with, with uh, our UCLA health leaders. Our second panel discussion is with our nephrologists, and we have a very exciting panel of, of uh, kidney doctors over here. And the first one that I would like to go to is Dr. Ehsan Noba from Washington, D.C. And he will be speaking on acute kidney injury in the second uh, setting of COVID-19. Hello, everyone. Dr. Ehsan Noba. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Sogi, for giving me this great opportunity to contribute in such a wonderful global event. There's awareness about kidney disease in the era of COVID-19 infection. It is well known that the primary target of COVID-19 is lung, causing pneumonia. However, what many people may not be aware of is that kidney is another target of this virus. COVID-19 infected patients, even those with no prior kidney disease, 
may experience a sudden loss of kidney function, which is called acute kidney injury. When COVID-19 infection becomes overwhelming, the blood pressure may drop, leading to a decline in kidney function. Scientific data is suggesting that COVID-19 can also directly attack the kidney tissue. Those individuals who develop acute kidney injury may have more complicated course of the disease. While acute kidney injury is often a reversible condition, some of patients may require short-term or even long-term dialysis therapies. My message to the audience of the UCLA Core Kidney Health Fair is, if you have had COVID-19 infection and you were told about a decline in the kidney function or having blood or protein in the urine, you will need to have a follow-up with your primary care physician or a kidney doctor because you will be at risk of developing chronic kidney disease. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hassan Nobak. And, um, you know, just going back to AKI in overwhelming COVID infections, after ventilators, it was the dialysis machines that actually was, was the most needed. And when we were looking at um, the surge preparedness, um, dialysis was actually quite a bit um, on the radar. And, and hopefully we won't have that surge, but if it does, so that was acute kidney injury. Now I would like to go over to Dr. Kamgar um, and look into patients who have kidney disease and how, how um, does COVID-19 affect them? Hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to talk. Uh, first, I want to thank you, Dr. Stogi, for the, uh, and the core kidney team uh, to make this happen. When we are talking about COVID-19 risk, it's important to know that we are talking about two different types of risks. First risk is acquiring the infection, which is usually related to the health and the strength of the immune system. And second uh, is when the patient gets the infection, how sick they become uh, during the disease uh, progression. Uh, so in general, people with early stage kidney disease probably are not at high risk for getting the infection. However, the uh, studies show, uh, including one of the studies from Seattle, that having chronic kidney disease could be a predictor of more severe disease. Uh, and you can get uh, more severe pneumonia and respiratory failure requiring uh, ventilation. Um, but people with more advanced kidney disease, such as patient on dialysis, can have weaker immune system, which make it uh, harder to fight infection. And uh, therefore, they're at increased risk of acquiring the infection. And when they get the infection, it can be actually more severe. Uh, having said, said that, it's important that uh, you take the necessary precaution um, that's recommended by the healthcare team while you adhere to the regularly scheduled dialysis uh, treatment um, that's uh, recommended by your doctor. That's awesome. Um, thank you, Dr. Kamgar. Um, once again, um, specific guidance to our patients who have, co have you know, uh, prior kidney disease. Now, um, I would want to go to my third panelist, Dr. Nilofer Nobak. Um, and he'll be talking about some of the things that the core kidney is doing, especially the clinical programs. Dr. Nilofer Nobak. I briefly, for a few seconds, focus on the C of the core, which is basically um, talking about clinical excellence. And by clinical excellence, we mean the way that we brought all these disease-specific programs, uh, like polycystic kidney disease, Albert, and diabetes, kidney disease, and Fabre. For a few seconds, I pause on Fabre because it's a multi-systemic genetic program with involvement of like brain, heart, and the kidney. And the nephrologist at UCLA Core Kidney has taken the leadership, taking care of these patients in a very comprehensive program. And it's like a one-stop shop. And we really want to replicate this to all diseases states that that's the central of what we do, the C, clinical excellence of the core. Um, wish you all the best for the next hour of this great virtual global program. It's so exciting to be here today, and uh, thank you much. 
So our comprehensive clinical programs, um, I think that's one of the C in, in our core program. So uh, we'll talk a bit more about that. I think uh, our next speaker is going to speak about early diagnosis and treatment or management of chronic kidney disease. So Dr. Suzanne Nicholas. One of the things that we're talking about today is called chronic kidney disease. It really is the terminology that describes a number of the things that you've already heard from Dr. Nilu Novak, um, such as Fabre's and, and polycystic kidney disease. And right now we want to say a few words about the importance of knowing that you have damage to your kidneys. And chronic kidney disease really refers to any anatomical um, or structural abnormality in your kidney or decrease in function in your kidney that has been there for at least three months. It has to be there for at least three months. You heard earlier the term acute kidney injury. That's when if you've had a sudden damage to your kidney and it lasts for um, and recovers within three months. So why is it so important for you to know that you have any damage to your kidneys? Well, for number one, if you do have chronic kidney disease, it may progress and it may lead to the need for some form of uh, kidney replacement therapy when your kidney stops working. And that kidney replacement therapy may be in the form of dialysis or um, kidney transplantation, and you'll hear a little bit more about that later. Other thing to know, the other thing to know is that it was mentioned earlier that having chronic kidney disease can be silent very early in its early stages, and it's only when you've lost a significant portion of your kidney cells and your kidney function, probably more than 75% of kidney function, that you start to develop any type of symptoms. So it's important for you to know that you have early kidney disease so that it's the uh, appropriate measures can be um, begun in, uh, immediately. But one of the important things to know about the having kidney damage is the fact that it can shorten your lifespan, particularly if you have kidney damage, chronic kidney disease from diabetes and high blood pressure, which are the two most common causes of kidney, chronic kidney disease. Having this can shorten your lifespan by 14 years for men and over 16 years for women, particularly if you have chronic kidney disease from diabetes. So what can you do? What you can do is to find out whether you do have kidney damage or chronic kidney disease. And this can be done by a blood test and a urine test. The blood test is called an estimated glomerular filtration rate, or EGFR. It's a test that measures how well your kidneys are able to filter the blood. And the urine test is called a urine albumin to creatinine ratio, or UACR. So when you go to your doctor, you can find out whether your doctor has measured those tests for you. It can be measured in one single lab test um, that can be done across the country at a number of hundreds of labs, as well as at UCLA. If you have a physician uh, here at UCLA, your primary care doctor. And again, find out about your eGFR on your UACR. If your UACR is greater than 30, it may mean that it's time for you to get some type of treatment that would help to, to stabilize it or prevent it from, from progressing any further. And if your eGFR has decreased in showing that a decrease in kidney function, particularly if it's less than 45 or 45% as an average, then it may be that you need to be uh, referred to a kidney specialist. And um, uh, here at UCLA, one of the things that we're doing, my colleagues and I, is that we're creating alerts within the electronic health record system that can identify patients who have some form of chronic kidney disease so that they can either be instituted for having medications, they can be tested for chronic kidney disease if they haven't been tested, or they can be referred to a nephrologist, a kidney specialist, for appropriate treatment. Again, within this COVID-19 pandemic, having chronic kidney disease, particularly from diabetes or hypertension, puts you at risk for adverse um, complications from that, some of which you've heard about, 
And so it's important for you to find out whether you do have chronic kidney disease. And I'm going to turn that over to back to Dr. Rastogi. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Nicholas. That was outstanding. And just to, to remind what Dr. Nicholas said, um, kidney disease is silent in majority of cases, and unless you check for it, um, you won't know it. And um, now we, we, we are going to have this alert system that if somebody's kidney function is below what it should be, or they're spilling protein, then the healthcare providers will, will and they, that will set up a system. Yeah, and it's important to just go to your regular doctor over and over, get blood yes. work, get a baseline. Right. So we know if baseline. things are changing, yep. because yes. you might not have a nephrologist, yes. Um, because you might not know you have kidney disease. So right. keep going to the doctor. Now, this panel is going to continue yeah. but because it's my job to be the heavy. Uh, everybody's learning about telemedicine. They're learning about Zoom calls. They're learning about all these things. So to all of our panelists who are on now and who are going to be on over the next hour and a half, hit that mute button if you're not the one speaking. Because if you hit the mute button, then we don't hear your kids running around in the background, the car alarm going off in the neighborhood, or if you're smoking and the fire alarm goes off inside your house. I don't know why it would, but just hit the mute button for your Zoom call or however you're uh, being put in so that we know everything's okay. And now you wanted to continue the panel. See, I, I'm just going to be the mean guy because you uh, and, won't. You're and, not nice. You're not uh, mean like that. And, I, and, and you're the good guy, so, so the good guy <laughs> or the bad cop. Um, so uh, we need to stick on time, too. Our, our next panel, but thank you so much, uh, because you know, we're sure. all learning. These are all technical problems. Uh, this is a global event. I mean, there's a lot of running from Boston, so we truly apologize if they're having any technical issues. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Naveen Raja, who has, uh, he's a rheumatologist by, by training, uh, but has been heavily involved with nephrology and rolling out some, some plans uh, that will, will be in line with what with, with Dr. Nobach said and also what, what um, Dr. Nicholas said. So, Dr. Raja? As you all know, your doctors and nurses and others help you manage your care, but you are the best champion for your care. So how do we engage you? We're embarked on a, on a project to really capture your goals, of, goals for your health, the goals you have for your health and your life, your values and your preferences, and we are trying to incorporate that into the decision making for your care. So we're building modules and other things to help us do that this year. In addition, we think that one of the best ways for you to learn about your disease is not just from your medical team, but also from other patients who've been through what uh, you might be going through. So for that reason, we're also um, uh, helping facilitate that through a number of means. One of the examples I want to give you is a video. We have uh, worked with a, a producer. His name is Jim Jusko, and produced a video where some of Dr. Uh, Rastogi and his colleagues' patients have shared their experiences through a video, and that video will be made available through the core website later, but um, you may want to watch that. It's really uh, engaging and uh, very uh, valuable in learning from the experiences of others who may be undergoing uh, similar experiences as you. I am Mary Beth Barry, and I had a wonderful career in the field of education. And it's been eight years since I was diagnosed with kidney failure. My name is Ivy, and I am a master's student at Cal State Long Beach, studying to be a school counselor. I've been on CKD for four years now. When my nephrologist told me the news that I had kidney failure, it, I was with my oldest sister because I have two older sisters and my mom and he had told us the news so obviously it was a huge shock and like we were all bawling our eyes out. When I was first diagnosed, you can just begin to imagine total panic and fear that overcame me. The message I received was that I needed to go on dialysis and that uh, my diagnosis was not very good, that I would be very lucky to have 10 years to be alive. To me, it felt like all my plans are changed because I was planning on transferring to UCLA. I was like planning on moving into the dorms, going to like my dream school. And I felt like I couldn't do that because I don't even know what this means, like being diagnosed with kidney failure. You know, somewhat you're in denial 
you're saying, oh, I'm getting older. This is a natural thing that will happen. But, you know, kidney failure is called the silent killer because there really aren't symptoms. That's why it's so dangerous. So um, I, I wanna, I'll leave it at that, but I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this event and uh, look forward to working with uh, uh, Dr. Rastogi and his team and wish all of you uh, health and happiness uh, during this time. Thank you, Dr. Raja. Um, so just, just to reinforce a point that you made is about shared decision-making. That is, the patients are involved in, in their care plan. And, and for them to be involved, they need to be educated. So I think both, both go hand in hand so they can make the right decision. So, so um, we look forward to that project. I think that is something that we at UCLA Health want to focus on, that our patients are involved in their, in their care plan uh, with, with the rest of the care team. The next speaker, we're gonna go back to Dr. Wilson. And Dr. Wilson will speak about some of his very exciting projects. Thank you, Dr. Rostovi, for uh, having this wonderful conference. And I'd really like to recognize all the volunteers that helped put this on, um, that really make this such a wonderful event. I think there's one volunteer that happens to be standing right there next to you by the name of Philip Palmer. If you look in the dictionary of remarkable human being, it's Philip Palmer. He is a outstanding husband and, and father. Um, he's obviously very accomplished in his, in his um, employment and really a trusted name and voice to all of us. He's an outstanding golfer. Do not ever play golf with him. Um, but more importantly, he's literally a lifesaver. And that's what this is all about. He's given a kidney um, to a very trusted friend, Dale Davis, who's going to be on later. And um, Philip Palmer and all the volunteers need to be recognized along with Dr. Rostogi. So thank you again for uh, allowing me to participate as well. Um, I'm working with Dr. Raja and the faculty practice group, Dr. Glazer and Dr. Pfeffer, to really change the way we identify and treat chronic kidney disease at UCLA. Chronic disease, uh, kidney disease is off, obviously very prevalent in um, many, many patients, but oftentimes it doesn't present until very late in the game, sometimes decades after patients really start to develop chronic kidney disease. So what we're doing here at UCLA is using artificial intelligence to predict which patients are going to develop um, CKD or chronic kidney disease. So obviously artificial intelligence is just using machines to carry out tasks in a way that we would consider smart. And we're working with the Department of Engineering using machine learn learning. So we're using a set of algorithms that parse data and learn from the parse data to discover patterns in our patients, patterns that predict chronic kidney disease. And we're using a number of neural network algorithms to find out which patients are most at risk for developing chronic kidney disease and identifying those patients well before they progress to sort of halt their progression and keep their kidneys healthy. So hopefully in the next year or so, we'll have a, a, a model that's up and running. And um, again, I really appreciate you allowing us all to be part of this wonderful event. Well, I just wanna to say to Dr. Wilson, He's the one that saved Dale Davis. You know, if he hadn't gotten involved very early on, yeah. um, we'll talk to Dale again, as he yeah. said later, but to all of the frontline workers that we've got out there right now, yeah. to the doctors uh, and nurses who are out there working on a day-to-day -day basis, whatever field you might be in, okay. if you're an essential worker. So thank you to all. Thank you, Dr. Wilson, and a lot of exciting projects. So um, we also want to thank some of our sponsors. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think they're more than sponsors in my view, they're, they're partners. And one of the big partners that we have is Davita. And I want to thank Davita for, for, for their partnership, uh, both in the acute setting and also in the chronic setting, outpatient setting. And um, we are working very closely. Like I said, when, when you and, and Dr. Uh, Asan Nobath went over AKI, acute kidney injury in the setting of, of um, overwhelming uh, COVID-19 infection and kidneys can get affected. And in those patients, you need dialysis and actually what we call continuous dialysis 24 seven. And, and we, we, we have been working very closely with Davida to make sure that if there is a surge, we are ready for that. Now, 
my my next uh, guest is Dr. Zaida Bhatti, a person that I know very well because we went to medical school together. Mm. And now she is in, in Erie, Pennsylvania, and she is an ID specialist, infectious disease, and she would like to share some of her experiences in Pennsylvania. So, Dr. Zaida Bhatti. Hello there, I'm Dr. Bhatti. I'm an internist and infectious diseases specialist practicing in Erie, Pennsylvania. First off, I welcome you all to this first virtual kidney fair organized by UCLA Core Kidney Program. Personally, I'm delighted to participate in this global initiative of cooperation and solidarity amongst all world citizens. I'm also connected to uh, UCLA uh, through my son, uh, Danish Bhatti, who is an undergrad uh, student uh, involved with brew and beans activities at the campus. As we are fighting this global pandemic, we've come to realize that uh, against any disease, prevention is probably our best tool to avoid potentially devastating consequences. COVID-19 is a new and unknown disease, but I'm confident that our scientists, public health experts, and the government who are working very hard day and night uh, will soon emerge uh, with uh, treatment uh, or vaccine or both. Uh, with the theme of prevention um, and cooperation, uh, I encourage you to uh, be an active participant in your, in your own healthcare goals, whether it is diabetes, high blood pressure, chronic kidney disease, or general well-being. The purpose of this fair is to provide you with such tools so you can become your own healthcare advocate. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the rest of this program. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Susan Rierich. I'm with Fresenius Medical Care in our Reno Pharmaceutical Division, coming to you today from Waltham, Massachusetts. We are so proud to sponsor this spectacular Kidney Health Fair educational event. As a member of the Velforo marketing team, our focus is to educate on the importance of phosphorus management in patients with kidney disease. And this event comes today at a great time. As we navigate through this pandemic, we truly are all in this together. For the millions of patients living with kidney disease, we admire your resilience. Thank you, Dr. Rostogi and the UCLA Core Kidney Team for all of the great work that you are doing out there. Once again, on behalf of the Belforo team, we're so proud to support this spectacular and greatly needed event. We look forward to continue to work with the UCLA core team and providing the best care that we can to our patients on dialysis. Thank you again, Dr. Rostogi, for organizing today's event. We hope you all enjoy it. And now I'll turn it back to you. It is so very important that uh, we are taking care of ourselves during this time of COVID-19, but it's also upon all of us. And I think that's one thing about core kidney is we care for each other. It's one thing that we care for each other as well. Dr. Rostogi and I are over six feet away from each other. Everybody in the studio has a mask. We're doing everything that we can to make sure that we personally can stop the spread because so many people get caught up in, well, I'm accepting this worry for myself, but you have to accept the worry that you might spread it to other people as well. It's not, you don't live in a bubble. So it's so important for us to all listen to the words of these doctors, not only protect yourself, but protect others as you do it. And one of the things we're also trying to do today is raise money. We're not gonna apologize for that, so make sure that you click on one of the links below. Those links are available for a year. We're trying to raise money for Core Kidney. We'll talk a little bit later too. We would love to inspire uh, UCLA Medical in general to come up with a kidney center so that we can have an umbrella where all of these resources and amazing things that are available at UCLA can come under one roof uh, with a, a very focused treatment options for so many people where you can get all of the information in one place. So we really want to do that as well. Um, but as we bring Dr. Rasogi back in here, uh, we talk about UCLA, we talk about uh, kidney research. You can't talk about transplants without your next guest. Oh, yes. And, and, and somebody who trained me. 
<laughs> so, so thank you there so you much, go. Uh, Dr. Palmer. Uh, so our next guest is Dr. Gabe Danovich, and I don't think he needs any introduction. He is the head of the UCLA Kidney Transplant Program. So with that, you know, they, there's a lot of questions uh, about transplant. Uh, is it safe in this setting? Can we do it? Um, and who better than, than Dr. Danovich to give his thoughts on that? So Dr. Gabe Danovich. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's uh, nice to be here with you. I must prefer to be with you in person. And I know out there are friends and colleagues around the world and patients and families. And I just want to wish you all well in these crazy COVID times. Um, before I, I start, I want to make a call out to two groups of people that have a particular place in my heart and I want to mention before we move on. First of all, I want to talk about the staff in the intensive care units. Doctors, nurses, technicians, cleaners, everyone who's out working in the intensive care units with patients who are the illest of the ill in COVID. And I think we need to remember them because they're right up there, all of them. And I just want us to remember them and thank them in our hearts for the work that they are doing. Second of all, I have a soft, soft spot for organ donors, for kidney donors. And that includes you, Mr. Palmer. I have a soft spot for you, believe it or not, because you've been a kidney donor and that's a wonderful thing. So all you kidney donors out there, I'm giving you a virtual hug, or at least with my elbow here. Uh, and also if there are families of, of, of deceased donors, families who, through generosity and, and citizenship, have donated or permitted or encouraged the donation of organs from their beloved, beloved ones who have been lost before that time. So let's talk a little bit about COVID. COVID has affected all our lives, every one of us, in ways that we could not have previously imagined, all aspects of our lives. And, and that kidney transplantation included, organ transplantation included. I can say that when this plague started, a living donor uh, kidney transplantation nearly came to a stop in this country, dramatic fall. Over the last few weeks, it's beginning to pick up as we've gained more and more confidence in the fact that, that we can safely bring in recipients and donors uh, uh, for living donor transplantation. Uh, and we're beginning to pick up. We're not quite back up to where we were, but I think we're getting more and more confidence and moving ahead. Deceased donation also dropped dramatically. For the same kind of reasons, concern about infection, concern about people coming into hospital. Um, uh, and once again, this fell off maybe about 40, 50% around the country and, 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 is, uh, and is beginning to, uh, uh, to pick up. I want to say something about the transplant patients out there who are taking immunosuppressive medications who might be understandably very concerned about their peculiar risk for uh, uh, COVID infection, given the fact that they have the risk factor of kidney disease, perhaps diabetes, and being on immunosuppressive medications. I want to tell you something that occurred to me that I would try for yourselves. And I would say, try not to, to live in fear, but rather live in care. Um, uh, things can be fa fearful. I think we can logically get through our lives if we're careful. And careful means washing your hands, uh, wearing masks, keeping social distancing, and following the, the recommendations of national and local authorities that are trustworthy. Uh, I mean, the CDC and, and your county officials and, and state officials listen to their recommendations follow them carefully and and be careful but not fearful i do think that uh, i it's very important for people particularly transplant patients 
And I'm patient with end-stage renal disease. To get outside, to be outside and get physical exercise. Many of us have been stuck indoors for sometimes weeks at a time, and that's not healthy. And I think now, particularly as we're getting a better understanding of this disease and how it and how and how it's transmitted, that 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 you can safely, but with care, go outside, go for a walk, go for a jog, go for a bike. Uh, uh, um, go to your local park when it gets open, uh, but try to get some exercise. Exercise is so important for transplant patients and patients with end-stage renal disease. I'm not an infectious disease expert, but from my understanding, the chances of getting COVID on the outside, when you're outside moving around, are very small. If the virus gets diluted, and I think if you're wearing a mask and keeping social distancing, you can safely go outside, get some exercise, go for a fast walk, get some fresh air and some sunshine. Uh, and I think that's something you should all do. I tell patients who are waiting for transplants, um, patients who walk will live longer. Patients who exercise will live longer. And physical exercise is so important for patients who are waiting for transplants and patients who are uh, have already had transplants. I know there's going to be a separate section on exercise uh, later in this meeting today, uh, but I cannot emphasize it uh, uh, emphasize it too much. So I want at this point to look forward to seeing you all under normal under the normal circumstances. Be careful. Don't be fearful, and I look forward to seeing you outside somewhere, perhaps in our clinic, perhaps outside. We bless you all and be safe. And let's all, by working all together and being good citizens, uh, we, can, we can get through this thing and, and move on better people. Thank you very much. So, Dr. Danovich, um, just a couple of things. Um, number one, your focus on exercise, which is actually right on. And um, if you stick around for a bit longer, you will see there is a section of a transplant patient running. So I really want you to see that. I mean, th this guy is amazing. Well, let's, uh, let me tell him something, too. Yeah. Uh, first off, one of the great things Dr. Danovich did for me many years ago was he helped us put together a piece on transplants, mm -hmm. dispelling the myths and everything that might go along with transplants. Yeah. But uh, to your point, Dr. Danovich, uh, it's been about four or five years, there was a group of 12 living kidney donors who ran in something called the Ragnar Relay. So we ran from basically Huntington Beach to San Diego as a group, all to prove life is normal after a transplant. Yeah. And so you are, a, I, I have no medical background, whatever, I can't tell you how true it is. Yeah. Being in strong physical shape or in healthy shape prior to a transplant surgery yes. helps your recovery immensely afterwards. Well, I tell people if I can and join Danovich, in now. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I tell people if yeah. I can yeah. add one thing that that getting ready for a transplant is a little bit like getting ready for a 10K or a half marathon or a marathon. You just don't do it. You don't go to do a 10K without going to training. Otherwise, you're going to crap out on the first corner. So I tell people if you're going to get a transplant, <laughs> you're planning a transplant on your transplant list. Get yourself ready. Consider Sit yourself in training. Yeah. And if I can give one piece of advice for uh, as a donor, one of the th greatest things for me after surgery was something as simple as walking. Walking. Just getting out and walking, and it helped me every step of the way, which takes us right into our next group of people that we're going to talk about. Right. So, first of all, I just want to say one thing about the living kidney donors, and, and we were supposed to build up a story, <laughs> but, but, but it's, it's out, and that's mm. okay. Um, with Dr. Danovich, he came to the first kidney fair on his bike, and and he was on the stage on his bike. So and and he he trained walks me. the walk. So uh, Dr. Danovich, for us, um, you know, our role model. So thank you so much, Dr. Danovich. We truly appreciate that, and and all the words of wisdom that that you still pass on to us uh, is very much appreciated. So that was Dr. Danovich. Now our next story is from a person that's, that's very dear to the Core Kidney Program and the Brewing Beans Health Club. And her name is 
Kelly Schaefer. So Kelly Schaefer, you're up next. Thank you for having me join in today. My name is Kelly Schaefer and I'm a recent UCLA graduate who is currently doing virology research at La Jolla Institute for Immunology. I initially met Dr. Rostogi as a patient. I suffered from chronic complex kidney infections and we could not figure out why I kept getting them. When I met Dr. Rostogi, I was a scholarship player on the UCLA women's tennis team. During my initial months on the team, I got very ill and had to be hospitalized. It was a rough road learning how to balance academics, sports, and extracurricular activities. Being a part of an NCAA championship winning team was an unforgettable experience and playing a sport at such a high level while facing these health problems has taught me resilience and persistence, which are skills that are necessary in medicine. My health issues have also given me a better perspective on patient-centric care for my future career as a physician. Dr. Rostogi embodies these patient-centric values and was the first physician to really sit down and listen to my medical history from start to finish. And after he learned that my career goal is to be a clinician scientist, he became my mentor. Throughout my time at UCLA, I was a part of the Bruin Beans Health Club, which is an undergraduate organization headed by Dr. Rostogi. It is one of the most prestigious undergraduate clubs on campus and is geared towards students who are interested in all aspects of health and medicine. It gives undergraduates the chance to be involved in the medical field, which is an invaluable experience early on in our careers. Without Bruin Beans, I would not be where I am today. I was involved in two research projects, a drug for the treatment of diabetic kidney disease and a study of living kidney donors. Being a part of these projects gave me hands-on clinical experience and taught me the importance of medical research. After graduating from UCLA in 2018, I accepted a scientific research position in a lab which specializes in the study of viruses. I currently do serology studies relating to Ebola and Marburg viruses. The purpose of this research is in the pursuit of monoclonal antibody treatments for both Ebola and Marburg viruses, which are within the same virus family. With a greater than 80% fatality rate, monoclonal antibody treatments are the best hope for a patient infected with Ebola. We have been using these serology tests to screen Ebola survivors and healthcare workers in the Democratic Republic of Congo for these precious antibodies. Smack in the middle of our work, the coronavirus pandemic hit. However, because of my lab's expertise in virology, we were given a large grant from the Gates Foundation to research monoclonal antibody treatments for severe COVID-19. We are working 24-7 in the hope of finding one of these treatments as soon as possible. I'm thrilled to be a part of this work, and I want to thank Dr. Rostogi for the experience of being a part of Bruin Beans Health Club, because it has certainly helped me get to where I am today. Thanks again for having me, and I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of the presentations. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, so Kelly Schaefer actually um, represents what, what a true Bruin is or Bruin Bean is. So she came to me, as she mentioned, uh, as a patient. Um, she was a top athlete and still is. She was on, on, on the UCLA tennis team. She got in, um, you know, actually much younger. She got in a year before. Uh, into college from, from high school because she was so good in tennis. Um, and then she has a lot of physical injuries because of that. So she fought that, she fought her infections, and she's now on her way. And then she was very instrumental. She was, I think, was being very humble, but she was kind of very instrumental in, in reshaping the Bruin Beans Health Club, which is now, uh, you know, doing quite well. And now she's working in a very top lab, and, and she worked on Ebola and is working on COVID-19. So how relevant that is, and, and, and one of the brightest people I've met. And, and what she didn't mention, which I do want to mention, is, and there's a reason why she's on this show today, is the first time she came to see me with her mom, um, I didn't know who she was, and I didn't know who her mom was. And now, you know, obviously, um, Tanya and Jim, and, and me, they're like family. But it was a conversation about her health, but then it became a scientific discussion about infections. And now she's doing, I mean, I wanted her to go into nephrology, but, but she picked, picked infectious diseases, and I'm completely fine with that. But, but this is the future. This is what we need to, to uh, you know, encourage. So thank you so much, uh, Kelly. Well, we, we can't do anything without sponsors. I mean, we have to have them, the list of them, DaVita, uh, Valforo, Baxter, Sanofi, Next Age, Amicus, and the one that we want to introduce to you right now, AstraZeneca. 
Well, hello, my name is Mina Makar and I'm the Senior Vice President for Respiratory and Immunology here at AstraZeneca. And I'm also the executive sponsor for the Hispanic Employee Resource Group with the company. You know, I'm so proud and thrilled um, that we have a chance to collaborate with UCLA Health and its core kidney program to make this virtual event happen. This is such an unusual time for all of us, I think, and COVID-19 has impacted so many people in so many ways, but consistent with AZ's um, values of following the science, putting patients first, doing the right thing, we've really worked hard to ensure the continued supply of our medicine to the patients who need them, safeguarding the health and well-being of our employees and the communities that we're in, which includes the donation of 9 million masks to support frontline healthcare workers throughout the world. It includes the recent announcement of a collaboration with Oxford University to potentially bring a vaccine as quickly as possible to patients. You know, we're all in this together, and I really want to thank UCLA for ensuring that this event continues despite COVID-19 because it's so critical that we continue to provide the valuable information to help improve the lives and well-being of our community. Best of luck today. AstraZeneca has been a partner um, and, and, you know, I didn't just say sponsors, but, but we have done a lot of clinical research with them and uh, we truly appreciate all the help. Um, and I know all of these big in industries are helping more than just uh, what they're supposed to do. They, they, the pandemic has affected all of us. So, so very grateful. Thank you so much, AstraZeneca, for, for being um, a supporter, sponsor, and, and more importantly, a partner. Now, my next guest is a very special person. Um, his name is Louis Simon. And I would like to, you to hear his story first, and then I'm going to come back with, with some of my own comments on that. So straight from, from Mr. Louis Simon. Hey, Dr. Sogin Phillip. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Louis Simon. I have ADPKD, and I'm also a clinical researcher in Dr. Stogie's research office at UCLA. So for me, PKD is very much a family affair. Um, it runs in, in my dad's side of the family. So my dad has it, his brother has it, their mother had it, and now I have it. Um, I remember growing up, I would see, you know, my dad had to take a lot of medications and had to go to the doctors quite a bit. Um, and it was all leading to him needing to be on dialysis. Um, and that was in 2005. Um, and, you know, he needed to be listed for transplant uh, soon after. Um, but I mean, as some of you probably know, the waiting list um, for deceased donor transplant is uh, very long, you know, ranging from maybe five years to upwards of 10 years. Um, so knowing that, you know, my mom just kind of on a whim um, went to see if she could potentially donate a kidney to my dad. Um, and she went to UCLA, got evaluated, and luckily enough for all of us, um, she was a match. And for me, PKD, you know, um, you know, my first, I guess, uh, personal experience with it was uh, when I was 11, um, you know, I was diagnosed via ultrasound. And, you know, at the time, you know, being very young, um, I didn't really know too much about it and I didn't really understand things. Um, it's more of a mental burden, you know, at these early stages because the way I describe it is um, it's like having a countdown clock kind of in the back of your mind, you know, like you don't currently have any symptoms, you're not really seeing any of the physical effects, but you know that at some point uh, in the future, you will experience these effects. I wanted to get involved somehow in um, PKD research and whatever I could do to help, you know? So um, I looked up clinical trials and I just happened to find one that was run out of UCLA and uh, the PI just so happened to be Dr. Stogie. So I uh, you know, started participating in the trial and we found the certificate from my dad's transplant. And um, you know, lo and behold, uh, Dr. Stogie had been the transplant physician um, for that particular transplant. So he had evaluated my mother to be a donor and also had overseen um, you know, some parts of the surgery as well. So uh, it's just a small world. It's funny how things work out. PKD had really made me um, very interested in clinical research. So you know, I reached out to Dr. Stogie and just to see if I could volunteer in his research office. And you know, he was uh, gracious enough to allow me to do so. Uh, you know, and it's all, all moving towards the goal of, you know, just contributing in some way to PKD research and uh, kidney disease research, research as a whole. It's played a huge role in my life and my family's life, but I mean, not just that. It affects millions of people, like, all around the world. 
if anyone out there with PKD, you know, would like someone to talk to or uh, just has any questions, and I'm, I'm by no means an expert, but, um, you know, I'm, of course, I'm always happy to talk to people about this. Um, uh, that's pretty much it for me. But, you know, thanks again for having me. And thanks for hosting such a great event. Take care. You know, there is a theme over here. We, we started with, with the leaders in UCLA Health. We had Dr. Glacier, Dr. Dr. Pfeffer, Dr. Uslan. Then we had all our excellent, excellent nephrologists, and then Dr. Danovich. And now it's all about patient stories. You hear, heard from Kelly. She had a lot of obstacles in her life. Um, she had injuries from her tennis. She actually had infections, but she fought them. And she went on and on and on. And now she is actually doing quite, quite well in her research. We, had, we have uh, Lewis, ADPKD, um, and then he came to me, and he, was on he used to drive all the way from San Diego to, for the studies. Um, one of the kindest, gentlest, most humble uh, human beings I've ever met. And um, Dr. Danimus said about, about sports, he was a captain of the, of the uh, and I was talking to Philip Palmer about, about uh, golfing and, and he was supposed to take me to golf and we haven't had that. Uh, I, I never played golf and I decided I never will but but um, but Lewis convinced me that I should do that and now he started as a volunteer. He's now a supervisor in a clinical, he's a study lead actually um, for clinical research and is going to be going for his doctoral degree, PhD in epidemiology. So so uh, Lewis I just want to say that that you are an example that, that we live by. And thank you very, very much uh, for all that you have done. Now, the one thing that, that Lewis did mention is that if you need to talk to him, you can, you, can, you can call him. And this is what we call a patient support group, patient advocacy. And that's why we had the kidney fairs to start with. Why do we call it a fair? The fair was because it was fun, but also educational. And unfortunately, we don't have it on the, on the beach. But I, I think this is being global event. It makes up for that. So Lewis said, you can call me. So what is it? he's an ambassador for the circle of core. And, and I don't have ADPKD. I know something about ADPKD. Dr. Nobach had mentioned we have a very successful and big ADPKD program that provides. And, and the reason why I say successful is because I think we, we do provide a comprehensive care, integrative medicine. And, um, and we have other programs like Fabrays and, 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 and a quite a few other programs as well. But I don't have ADPKD myself. And, and, and somebody who has lived through it will probably be able to explain that better. So we have, have now something called Circle of Core. This is our, an ambassador program. And this is going to lead into our next uh, panel discussion is on, on Circle of Core. So let's start with the first panel that is on Circle of Core. And it's my really privilege and honor to introduce Brian Gillum. Now, um, I didn't realize his last name is G Gillum because it's spelled as Gilliam. So I, I apologize for that. Uh, no Brian is, is a living kidney donor to his dad, Dana. And, uh, but beyond that, that's one part. Uh, you know, when somebody's a living kidney donor, they are at a different level. I mean, there's no bigger gift you can give. And I think Dr. Danovich uh, uh, touched on that briefly. There's no bigger gift you can give to another human being than a part of your own body. And, and, and that's why, you know, we have Philip Palmer. Um, all these people are, are incredible human beings and supermans and superwomans. And you'll be hearing a lot more in, in our next few uh, sessions. But, but let me talk a bit more about uh, Brian. So Brian and, and I met, I think, a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, a very, you know, pleasant gentleman, um, his wife, Roxy, his two kids. And, and, and that was it. You know, we meet somebody and then we move on. But what really, really impressed me about Brian was that how much he went out of his way to give back. Not he has given his kidney. He can't give any more. But his, his dedication. And I can tell you, it's people like Brian that we, why we are here. Uh, this event would not have been possible if it wasn't for Brian. Every single day for the last 10 days, he drives all the way from Orange County with his family, his wife and two kids, to make sure that, that the event will go. 
he was still typing and emailing. So, so Brian, I don't want to say too much, but I just want to say, you know, uh, we're very fortunate to have a person like you. And what I would like to ask you, what is the circle of core? Because we talk about the core kidney, and maybe you can start with the core kidney first, and sure. then what the circle of core and we're, is. We're, we're very thankful to have you leading us too. That's, that's uh, an honor. Um, the circle of core um, is clinical excellence, outreach, research, and education, also awareness. Um, but we started this because the patients of Dr. Rostogi and the core kidney program, um, we formed our own organization called the Circle of Core. Our purpose is to do outreach, patient support, advocacy that the um, core kidney program truly believes in. And then seeing my dad go through this process, uh, being on dialysis, there's a lot of gaps in the system and there's a need for guidance and navigation. And as patients, we can provide this uh, information. Also as donors and recipients, um, we can show people who are in need, um, who want to donate a kidney, how the process goes from both sides. We support patients and their families as they navigate this complex process. We have great people, great people, and great examples of um, just great human beings in our group that are here to help everyone. Um, as ambassadors, we take on unmet needs. We navigate different aspects of donation. and We help recipients and, uh, don and donors to learn the process. I became an ambassador because I wanted to make a difference in someone's life and uh, by helping them through this process. As a living, do as a living kidney donor, I can uh, tell you com I am completely and physically healthy. Um, I feel incredible. Uh, the message is this is a positive event. You can save someone's life by becoming a donor. Kidney donation is a big step, but the donor's health comes first by far above and all. And I can tell you exactly how it is to go through it, exactly how it is to go through it. Uh, it's a safe procedure. You can always contact me or anyone from our Circle of Core at the website uh, for more information. Right. So, so Brian, just want to say a couple of things. Um, you know, uh, it is a donor-centric program. Dr. Danovich, uh, obviously, is our transplant director um, for the entire transplant, kidney transplant program. Um, and we take it very serious. It's a donor-centric. And I know uh, Mr. Palmer went through this and some of the other people. Um, and it's our job because, you know, um, from a donor's perspective, they're very emotional about the process, right? And it's our job to stay objective. And that's why what UCLA has done, which once again, I'm not saying that because I'm a Bruin, I'm a true Bruin. I mean, that's the only program that I've known. But, but I, I, the UCLA Health, the transplant program under Dr. Gritch and, and Dr. Danovich um, has made sure that there's a complete separation between the recipient and the donors. Absolutely. Uh, because there could be, you know, conflict over there. And we have to be as objective as we can. And sometimes we say things that the donor doesn't want to hear. And we'll get into that as well. But but thank you so much, uh, Brian, thank to being you. a leader. And and I know you have a couple of your colleagues that are, and what is that, this ribbon on, on your... Uh, this is the green ribbon. The green ribbon. This is our, our logo, our okay. insignia. For kidney disease. Exactly, for the kidney disease. So with that, I want to bring um, a couple of people, and one is uh, Mr. Ravi Bojwani, um, who actually um, started the Green Ribbon campaign a few years ago with, with Brandy. And uh, uh, Ravi, tell us more Hi, about Dr. the Green Ribbon Rostogi. campaign. Hi, Dr. Rostogi. Hi. Um, I hope I'm live, and I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I just a want to thank you and thank the whole team for doing this. It's incredible and so much love. Um, I'm a kidney recipient. I received my kidney in uh, 2017. Um, so my story is I moved to LA in 2016. I was diagnosed with kidney disease as a child and it really just kicked in after I moved here. Um, I went out and I tried to search and research and do as much information as get as much information as possible. And I wanted to find out everything I could. And what I found is there was not a lot available. It was very, it was all over the place. There were bits of information. A lot of it was contradictory, especially when it came to diet. Um, and I was also looking for the top nephrologist and I found Dr. Vestogi, which was a big blessing and the core kidney program at UCLA. As, we, as I learned more and more, I became involved with Brandy and with UCLA to launch the Green Ribbon Campaign. It, the main purpose of it was to raise awareness for kidney disease. The fact is, this is a disease that's silent. People don't know they have it. 
it impacts nearly 15% of America, which is, you know, one in seven people have kidney disease. And the scariest part is 90% don't know they have it. So the purpose of the green ribbon is to raise awareness. As we wear our ribbons and people ask us and we share our stories, people learn. And our goal is to wear these ribbons, to have our friends and family wear these ribbons. And as you're going out, if people ask you what it is, tell them it's for kidney disease and tell them it's a silent disease. The goal is to really just teach people, raise awareness and step up the testing so those that have it can be found early. Um, the other thing is, is that a lot of people don't realize that you can share your spare kidney. You need one to live very normally in a very healthy life. Um, you have to be in perfect health and UCLA is amazing at, at checking that and making sure that this is a safe surgery for you. Um, but you can really impact the life. So a little bit about my story. The first time I met Dr. Rostogi, he looked at me and he said, you need to find a living donor. That was, um, I didn't think it was possible, but I went out, I did everything he said. I spoke at events, I went on social media, and then my angel Sarah literally came out of nowhere. Sorry, it's very emotional for me. Um, so just on that note, I'm very open to speaking with, sharing my story, sharing everything I learned to anyone that needs it. So just reach out to the Core Kidney Group or the Circle of Core and they will put you in touch and I'd be honored to support you. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Let me just talk about a bit of the green ribbon. So, you know, we all, all know that, that um, pink is for breast cancer. Two of my aunts had breast cancer and passed away from that. So that's, that's very near and, and to my heart. Um, but, but nobody knows about green ribbon. And I didn't know about it either. Why green, green ribbon? And, and let me put it this way. That's over here. Why, why the green ribbon? Um, you know, what does it have to do with kidneys? And we still haven't figured that out. And we want to change the color to, to uh, reddish brown because that's the color of a healthy kidney. But anyways, I was told not to do that. Let's stick with green ribbon. And that's what it is. The green ribbon campaign was started at UCLA. And, and it's about increasing awareness. So the prevalence of kidney disease in the adult U.S. population, one in seven have kidney problems. 37 million. That, 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 that's what it's about. But more importantly, nine out of those 10 don't even know that they have kidney disease. One in three patients who end up on dialysis have never seen. There's high mortality, high morbidity, and financial cost uh, um, associated with that. Now, why am I telling you all this stuff? Is being proactive is very important. And I think that's what the goal of the Circle of Core is. That's what the, the, the Green Ribbon Campaign is, is to, to make people aware so they can intervene early once it has progressed to a certain point, then it's difficult to, to get the kidney function back. But, but it's our job. So wear this green ribbon. And, and if somebody asks, what does it stand for? You have a story to, to tell them. Well, let's, let's say this, as far as just to kind of wrap up the panel on, on the donors. There are so many things that doctors can tell you. There are so, like you've said, you know a lot about yes. uh, kidney disease, You've never had it. Right. Um, for a person who's gone through the procedure, who's had kidney disease, they can share elements of what they've done that a doctor does not know. And if you'd like to help with the research, and, or rather, if you'd like to help uh, fund that, which is, again, what we're trying to do, you can go to giving.ucla.edu slash kidney. If you'd like to make a, a donation, because it helps us put on events like this, it helps us do fairs when we can all get together, and it helps people uh, find a way. It takes money to do this, and it gives us a chance to find a way to make sure that people understand what you might be going through, what you could go okay. through, and how to deal with it from a patient perspective as opposed to simply having a doctor tell you something. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the, the essence of the circle of core, and that's the essence of, of core. And... and it can't come from a better person than, than Philip Paul. It can come from better people. No, I, I met Brian just yeah. a second ago. Yeah. <laughs> we can start there. But we, we're international today. So yes. we got we to go international once again. Okay. So this, this next, all these stories are very dear to me. But this one is very touching. And this story is coming. I had mentioned that all continents except Antarctica. And I think uh, Philip had promised me that he'll get somebody from Antarctica before the end I of the failed. day. Uh, I well, failed. Well, we still have about half an hour. Um, 
But the next one is straight from the heart of Africa. It's from Kenya. And um, the person speaking from Kenya is somebody that I've met, I've worked with, and my hope is that we all, as a core kidney program, will be working a lot more. They, if you look at the attendees of today's event, there are quite a bit of people from Kenya. And this is not just from Nairobi, it's actually throughout the country, and they've signed in. They're actually on uh, the event. And so, without further ado, I would like to introduce Lizzie. My name is Lizzie Mudoni Wanyoike, principal and founder of NIBS Technical College. In this technical college, we train various courses from business to technical programs up to diploma levels, mainly in technical programs, which will enable them to get jobs immediately after college. I realized that uh, so many students were dropping out of college. I wanted to find out why. It is at this level that I went out into our rural areas. So from that time, I made up my mind that I will try as much as possible uh, to give this, try and break this chain of poverty. Uh, during these tours into our rural areas, I also came across some people living with disabilities. And within those families, none of the families could afford to, to pay fees for their children. Liz Wanyoike met a group of disabled people, absolutely disabled, poor and needy. And in this particular day, they have gathered in one of the homesteads where one of their members come from. When you see a young man like this one, yeah, you know, he looks okay. And this is a young man who can actually can can get can can get proper medication and become normal. This is not a gone case. I'm I'm very optimistic that this young man, maybe through people out there, through a combination of so many uh, people coming together, and there are many they can also assist. In their group, they have accommodated the abled for a healthy coexistence. Most of them go through daily medical checkup, which is costly, but together we can help them make it in life. Uh, in such cases, I decided to pick some of these young people from the village so that I can bring them to college. They can be trained in programs that they will be able to get jobs. They can earn some money to assist their families in buying medication, training them on how to avoid those simple diseases. First of all, we started by having our students take a walk and they raised about $2,000, which was very, very, very welcome because we were paying fees by installments. Later on, we were joined by the UCLA Core Kidney Program at Joe in creating awareness into our rural areas in healthy living and also how they can avoid kidney diseases, which is becoming rampant in our country. And today, we have been working together. We still need more well-wishers, as the list has gone very high. Each student requires $3,000 to take them through high school and up to a three-year program at the diploma level. And so I'm appealing to well-wishers to come and join me in this venture, and we will really appreciate. So that was on tape, and Lizzie is going to join us now live. But before we talk to her, we need to tell you that if you'd like to see a whole 10-minute video from Lizzie, you can just by getting onto one of those panels at the bottom of your screen. Uh, Lizzie, welcome. Thank you for being here internationally. It's an amazing event. CORE, the E. CORE stands for education, and that is a huge focus of yours. Can you tell us a little bit about how much money it would cost? That, that How much money do you need to really promote your education? Yeah, now we have a list of, uh, first of all, I'm going to mention that I've been doing it since 2007, and we have 70 who have graduated. Now we have 60 who are currently in college. And we have 200, over 200 on, the, on our waiting list. And uh, we have tried our best to reduce the cost. And now 
at least with $2,500, the students can go through the whole program and uh, attain a diploma. Uh, I really believe in education because, I, like I said in the video, these are the people who go and at least talk to their, to their parents and talk to the people up in the villages on healthy living, which is very, very important to prevent diseases like the kidney diseases, cancer, which is rampant in our country. And that is what I've been doing. Lizzie, with so many people on the waiting list, how do you choose who gets in and who doesn't? Because that's a lot of people to have to choose from. Uh, as you can see, we normally go out in the villages uh, to check them on the spot. Without any warning, we just ask them where they live, we, we talk with them, we go through their chips, and then we get to see their homesteads. And uh, we, then we took that, we will normally take them according to the level, the need level. So that's what we are doing. We have already selected uh, the ones who are going to to join us as soon as we reopen. We don't know uh, uh, when we are going to reopen, but uh, they all know that uh, there are too many and uh, I don't have donors. Normally I used to use my salary and again we do some I selling some clothes there, some uniform to high school and getting some money that I put together. And so we, they, they, they know that is very, very, very competitive. So we are able to select the most needed. Lizzie, thank you very much for joining us from all the way around the world. And thank you even more for the wonderful work that you do. So, so, thank you very much for can, can, can I speak really since I have Lizzie on? Yeah. Um, so, so Lizzie, um, who's that, 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 that young girl who's sitting next to you? What's her name? This is Chanel. Chanel, can you say your name? Say hi and say your name. Hi, my name is Chanel Waira Kanyoki. Charnel, that's a beautiful name, Charnel. So, um, you know, I've, I've heard a few stories about you, Charnel. Uh, you go to a top school, uh, a Catholic school, I think, in, in Kenya. And, and for some reason, a lot of the top schools in at least these countries are Catholic. Um, I, I went to St. Xavier's too, um, and, and that was still probably the best school in Jaipur. Uh, but I was also told that you're the top student in the top school. So, congratulations on that. Um, but I, I have a question. Um, and the question is, um, you know, how, how do your parents afford, um, you know, uh, Lizzie spoke about the cost, but, but how, how, do, how do your parents afford to send you to, to such an expensive school? My uncle Joe pays for my school fees and upkeep. Your, your uncle Joe, okay, so, so we'll, 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 we'll talk about more about Uncle Joe. Um, in, in, in a second. Um, so, so you are a top student. So what, what do you want to be when you, you grow up? A medical doctor. A medical doctor? Wow. And, and why is that? Uh, uh, because of you and Uncle Joe. Because of me and Uncle Joe? <laughs> oh my God! Yeah, it, it, it's first, um, Carnell. I, I just want to say that that you. How how old are you? I'm sorry. I'm twelve. Twelve years old, Carnell. You have a very bright future, you know. And and keep on keep on doing what you're doing. Be good at school. Study science is the way. And you mentioned somebody called Joe. So let me talk a bit about Joe, uh, because I think that he, he, um, he, yeah, he couldn't be here today because he worked all night. Um, and uh, he is a physician from Kenya and uh, came to the US and uh, became a nurse, got his nursing degree, and he runs my home dialysis program. And um, 
and I've never, I haven't met a more caring healthcare provider than Joe. And I've, I've, I've met a few, and and patients are always first and last. So whenever you know we get caught up in this day-to-day -day activities, and and we have meetings, and we have conferences, and we have travel. When I'm in doubt, I always say, what would Joe do in this situation? And, and I always have the right answer. So Joe is an incredible human being. Um, I think, and, and why do I bring that up? So education is key. And, and you mentioned, uh, Philip, that E in core is education, right? I'm a strong believer in education. Joe, when, when he was growing up, he would walk two and a half hours one way to go to school. And his mother could only take him halfway because she had other kids at home. And they were wild animals. Well, well, and that's sometimes he didn't even have shoes. And he's here now, right, in the US and supporting back people back home. And that's, Charnel, what education does. So I just want to uh, thank, um, and by the way, both of you have beautiful dresses. Are, are those uh, native uh, Kenyan dresses? Yeah, this is a uh, very popular that's, that's Maasai beautiful. dressing, way of dressing. We dress this during Maasai, most okay. of our occasions. This is Maasai. So, so Charnel and, and, and Lizzie, uh, what I do promise, I promise you in the past, I'll promise it again. I look forward to the core kidney to working with you. And I was supposed to come in 2018. For whatever reason, I couldn't come. Uh, but. Uh, if things open up, I'll be coming next year, obviously with Joe, but Philip Palmer is coming with me as well, uh, <laughs> with, with his beautiful wife, Maureen. So, Lizzie, thank you very much, um, and until till, till the next time, uh, be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Charnel. Thank you. Bye. Okay, thank you. And next up on our list is continuing our international travel. Okay, who's next? This would be our stories from the Middle East. Oh my God, okay. Now, so let me introduce our next. So our next story is from, from somebody, who, one of the top, nef not one, probably the top nephrologist from Iran, and Iran and Persia, and, and we have a lot of Persians, especially in Westwood. You know, we have a lot of Persians in, in, um, at UCLA Health. And Dr. Ali Nobakht from, from Iran is going to be joining us. And he is an incredible physician, human being, and has personally taught me so much. But before that, um, I think we have a message from Radio Hamra. Uh, and we'll play that video. Um, and then, then we'll go straight to Dr. Dr. Ali Nobakht. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Mo Mozini is here on behalf of Radio Hamra, a global Persian radio station. I would like to thank core kidney department at UCLA for making this global virtual event happen. I wish you all health and happiness, especially for core kidney and nephrology department at UCLA. Stay safe. Hi from Tehran, ladies and gentlemen. First, I would like to congratulate Dr. Rasogi for organizing such an amazing virtual kidney health event. Thank you very much for providing me with this unique opportunity to contribute to UCLA Core Kidney Health Fair. This is truly a great effort to show solidarity among those affected with kidney disease during this horrible pandemic. Please allow me to start with a famous poem from Saadi Shirazi Persian great poet, 8th century ago. He said, Bani Adam azaye yek pekarand, ke dar afarinesh zeyek goharand, cho uzvi be dar dawarad ruzgar, degar uzvha ra namanad gharar, to kaz mehnat digaran bighami, nashayat ke namat nahan dadami. Human beings are members of a whole. Since in their creation, they are of one essence. When the condition of the time bring a member to pain, the other members or limbs will suffer from discomfort. You, who are indifferent to the misery of others, 
It is not fitting that they should call you a human being. This global crisis has reminded everyone that all human beings are in the same very small boat regardless of our so-called differences. COVID-19 doesn't recognize any borders, race, religion, or nationality. Unfortunately, lung is not the only victim of COVID-19. Other organs, including kidney, can be injured by COVID-19 infection. Patients with chronic kidney disease are at higher risk for developing more severe illness when affected with COVID-19. Patients who are suffering from chronic kidney disease may have weaker immune system, which make the fight against the infection more challenging. In addition, COVID-19 infected individuals without prior kidney disease may develop acute kidney injury requiring dialysis therapy. Patients with chronic kidney disease should follow the general recommendations and precautions for COVID-19, such as frequent hand washing and face covering and social distancing. It may be more thoughtful to use the term physical distancing, since that we need the most during this crisis is to stay together and avoid social isolation. It is very important to mention that patients with chronic kidney disease who require dialysis should continue with their dialysis. And dialysis is a life-sustaining treatment. Those who receive kidney transplant should continue the immunosuppressive medications without interruptions. The risk of spread among these patients is very high and should be averted taking all precautionary measures. Let's thank all healthcare professionals around the world for providing care to those in need at cost of their own and their family's health. There is no doubt that by collaboration of all nations through synergistic solutions, global challenges such as COVID-19 can be overcome. Thank you very much. The next story is very dear and close to, to us. So, Philip, tell me more about your story. Well, it's a little bit about the reason why I'm here, I suppose, is mm -hmm. um, sadly, like uh, so many thousands upon thousands of people every year, a friend of mine got sick. Um, and I think so many of the things that were discussed with uh, kidney disease earlier uh, hold true for Dale Davis. Dale Davis didn't even know he was sick um, until it was too late. And um, I don't want to steal his story because he's a mean Texan. Um, and so we, we, we went straight to Texas to find out more about Dale's story. He's uh, standing by. He's going to talk with us. And Dale, uh, so many of these stories that we're talking probably ring pretty true for you today. Um, tell me about how you figured out you were sick. And then another part of this story that I think many people need to understand is a transplant doesn't end your health care treatment. I mean, your illness still is with you. And it is to this day. Yeah, uh, my story is your story because uh, 14 years ago, uh, I, I, I was started having headaches. I'd never been to a doctor. I'd never had the flu, never been sick. But these headaches were just debilitating. So I went to an eye doctor thinking I needed glasses, and it came back to I had kidney failure. And so through that process, I found out I, I had chronic kidney failure and needed a transplant. You, being the hero that you are, uh, went to go get tested, and uh, you were a match. And you donated a kidney and saved my life. And because of your gift, I was able to see both my daughters get married. Uh, I had my first grandchild a couple of days ago. Uh, well, I didn't, but my, my daughter did. And uh, uh, it's just been quite a, uh, an ordeal. It's not what you do, it's who you are. I mean, he, he saved my life many times, and it's been such a help walking me through the process when it can sometimes be overwhelming and coordinating your medications because there's so many intangibles of, the insurance yeah. company, uh, the doctor's office, 
uh, just pharmacy, one. just coordinating everything can be so difficult, and you don't have a, a doctor or a system like UCLA working, uh, can really be difficult. So I'd like to thank Dr. Wilson for saving my life. And uh, sadly, uh, last year I was having my labs done, and uh, one of my medications uh, had gone rogue and failed. And so I, the last year has been a real struggle for me. Um, and I had to go back on dialysis, and I do need a kidney transplant again. And uh, whereas uh, 14 years ago, Philip, you and I have went so smooth. You know, I think I went from diagnosis to transplant in four or five months, and everything just worked perfect. You were a great match, and, and I thought, hey, this is easy. And this time around, it's not been so easy because last year I had to have uh, some blood transfusions, and I, I, my system built up antigens, and it's made it more difficult to find a match. I've had friends and family go get tested but it just hasn't worked out so far. So I am on dialysis, and I'm waiting for, for that match. And, and uh, so I'm seeing it from the other side now uh, where it's not easy, and it just makes me so much more passionate about raising awareness, and it's great to, to wear the ribbons and, and do what you can, but go get tested. You know, everybody talks about, I want to make a difference. You know, how can I make a difference in this life? What can I do? And I think you summed it up best that I always go back to, Philip, uh, 14 years ago. When we were, were doing a, a story with Good Morning America, uh, they ask you, why, why did you do this? Why did you give your Philip to, to Dale, to me? And you, you just said, how could I uh, let my friend die without a kidney and me live with two? And I just thought that was so poignant and just such a great way to express it. And, uh, you know, I, and that's about all I got. That's my story. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. I'm not even know if you can hear me. And, uh, but anyway, it's great to see you, Philip. Oh, we can. I'll, I'll tell you, Dale, I think it's you, you bring up the medication that went rogue on you, uh, and we're not going to take up everybody's time here, but I would advise, and I think you would as well, to stay abreast of the latest treatments because your medicines, there might be something better out there uh, than what you're currently taking. So you can't just get a transplant kick back and think everything's going to be okay, right? I mean, you really need to stay up on everything. That's absolutely right, Philip, and... And that, that may have cost me. I mean, I, I'm from Texas. I grew up in Texas. That's where I'm at now, Houston. And, uh, and so my, my care transferred here, and they were like, well, go get your labs every six, nine months. You're fine. And, and that's great. But had I gone and done my labs every three months, they may have been able to cut it and reverse the kidney damage that this rogue medication cost. Now, I don't know that for sure, but when I get a transplant next time, you can bet that I'm going to go to labs every couple of months regardless. Well, Dale, the audio is getting a little bit low, but I think we got your message loud and clear, and that is uh, be your own advocate on your health care. Uh, get in front of it. Uh, thanks again, Dale. I'm going to uh, bring Dr. Rostogi back. Uh, one of the things that Dale always said to me that was so, so telling, uh, and, and you could probably speak to this even better when it comes to kidney disease, he never understood why he was tired. He never knew because his family never had kidney disease, but he'd end the day and he'd be like, I don't understand why everybody wants to go out and have dinner. I just want to go home and take a nap. So there are so many tells that people probably are unaware of if, if they don't have, have, have a history of yeah. kidney disease. But what Dale's talking about is the core mission as well. Yeah. From a patient perspective, being able to share your stories with other people is so important. Whether it's meds, whether it's how you felt before, whether it's how you felt and recovered after, sharing sharing is caring, caring. you know and uh, that is what core is all about educating right. people right. as well and now he's a member of the core you know he's a, he's our ambassador and um, and uh, you know so he's sensitized so yeah. he got some blood transfusions he has a kidney transplant it's a bit more difficult to get him you know matched but i think our circle of core is going to work very aggressively and dale um, you, you're, you're part of the team now so it's our mission and i'm sure um, you know after hearing all the stories today There'll be more people coming forward. Um, but say, thank you so much, Dale. We'll be in touch. Um, and Philip, once again, I can't thank you enough for, for you know, what you have done. I mean, the ultimate gift. I love being one of 7,000 people <laughs> every year, every year, living donors. So now, what about Next Stage? So Next Stage is, is one of our sponsors, and uh, we want to hear from Kelly uh, from Next Stage. She wants to say a few, few things. Hey, this is Kelly and Zoe in Dozer. On behalf of Next Stage, I wanted to thank the UCLA Core Kidney Program for presenting this amazing global event. It's truly an unmet need in the community, and we value our partnership 
in both inpatient critical care and outpatient home hemodialysis. Our common goal is to provide the best patient care to all of our patients. Enjoy the fair. Thank you so much. Um, that was an excellent video on Next Stage. Um, they work both with our home dialysis patients and also in the acute setting, uh, CRT. And I just want to make a call out to uh, our Baxter team as well. We work very closely with the Baxter team, especially for home dialysis. And uh, there are several projects that we're working on with them. So I want to thank Baxter for their support. Hello, Dr. Rostogi, Core Kidney Team, UCLA Health, and all of the attendees for the 2020 Kidney Fair. This is Guillermo Amesqua from Baxter Healthcare. I'd like to thank everybody for attending today's event. It's tremendous to hear how the nephrology community is coming together in this time and always to make sure that patient care, clinician support, and excellent programming is available to every single person in this country. I understand that this year, it's truly a global event, and we couldn't be more excited to hear the perspectives of so many of you as we all work together on the mission that we share, which for Baxter is represented through our mission to save and sustain lives. But we know that that can be described in so many ways. And in so many different ways, we're all so aligned on making sure that the very best technology, the very best programming, and the very best care is delivered on a daily basis. Baxter is so excited to share its innovation and technology along with its supplies, service, and support to so many of you out there who are providing care to our patients and to one another during this very interesting time. I hope to see all of you next year in 2021 in Santa Monica on the beach. Until then, I wish you all the very best. Dr. Rasogi, I thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you to you and your team. Thank you so much and have a fantastic kidney fair. I, I will say that one of the great things, uh, again, we would love if we could see a one kidney center at UCLA. Yeah. I mean, this is my opinion. I think it would be a, a, a great thing. What UCLA does is wonderful in and of itself, but uh, take that amazing engine and then, and then really fine tune it. Uh, we'd have a Ferrari or whatever high performance uh, vehicle that you'd like to use as a description. If we could somehow find a way to do that. But in the meantime, the mission of CORE is so important. I say it from a person who knew absolutely nothing about kidney disease um, before my friend Dale got sick. Um, but I feel like uh, I've been educated by some of the best because I, to be honest, I have a different platform than people do. I have the ability to talk to Dr. Danovich. I mean, how many people get a chance to sit and talk to Dr. Danovich and ask him every single question they might want to know? They, everybody doesn't. But because I work on TV, I got that chance. I've had a friendship with you now. I've had so many different people involved in my life that have given me answers to questions that I didn't even know I had. And it's very important for me, it's important for Dale, and for Sarah Faden and her husband, Bobby Norman, and Kathleen Hosterd and Craig Hosterd, who I could go on and on and list so many people that are now my friends. The one thing Sarah Faden, who's an LAPD officer who donated to her husband right about the same time as Dale and I, one thing she told me many years ago is the reason she wore the green band, and it's one of the reasons I think the green ribbon is important. No one knows that I've ever been a kidney donor. They don't know, they don't know that she has, they don't know that Kathleen has unless we tell them. Yeah. Because there's nothing wrong with me physically, there's nothing wrong with my health. Yeah. And so if we don't tell that story, if we don't spread that word, yeah. then it just quietly goes away and people don't realize it's possible and there is a tangible change that I have made in one person's life. And that's Dale Davis, who not only, as you mentioned, I don't know if you could hear it, not only did he see his daughters get married, he got to be a granddad two days ago. And that is a very real change, very real thing that has happened. And I've been blessed so many times over, and I know that my friends would say the same. So CORE's mission, what UCLA Health is doing, is so important because it is not only changing one life, the ripple effect goes on and on and on. But we have to keep talking. We have to keep telling our story. Yep. Philip, I mean, I, I, I can't thank you enough. And I just want to, Pleasure before we here. get into the spirit walk and run, I do want to make a comment about you said affecting an individual, but you also extend that affecting a family, he's, he saw. But I go even one step further, it affects society. Uh, you're giving a, a functional member back 
you know, who gives mm -hmm. back. You know, look at Mary Beth, look at Ravi Bojwani's, uh, Mark Cornell that, that you didn't see, Patrick. So I think it's, it's, it's the impact that you have, the ripple, is way beyond. And, and you guys are, are inspiration to other people. Let's You're don't forget Brian. Standing right over there making this whole thing happen I, today. I, so. I can't, I can't, but thank you so much. Yeah. Now I want to uh, send it to, to Mark, Coronel, uh, Brian, and Mary Beth. There they are. Mark and Mary Beth, I can see your green ribbons. You Let's see? Go. Perfect. Thank you guys so much. Yes. That was so yes. amazing. Um, uh, this is for our kidney fighting community. Um, uh, I'm five months post kidney transplant, whether you're running for yourself, a parent, family member, friend, or just want to support. Remember, our race is not a sprint. This is a lifelong journey marathon. And on behalf of the core kidney program, I'm running for team Rose Yamasaki, who recently received the kidney transplant from UCLA, as well as Kenya, Hong Kong, Dubai, London, Toronto, Singapore, Mexico, Finland, Manila, Serbia, Istanbul, Spain, Vancouver, Pakistan, Singapore, Sri Lanka, India, Japan. This is a worldwide <laughs> virtual event connecting people for the cause of kidney health. Yeah. Thank you very much, Doc. I'm going to go run now. <laughs> okay. Let's go okay. run. Come on, <laughs> stop you, talking about it. Let's have the spirit. Okay. Oh, Dr. Danovich right. said, go exercise. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Bye, Mary Beth. <laughs> My name is Shauna. I am in Yokohama, Japan. I am walking today to support the Kidney Core program for UCLA. I donated my kidney in December of 2019 and I still have my bracelets. Check these out. And I am walking today because there are still many people that need help and I want to support them. And so I walked today to do that. All right, Mark, here we are, in your honor. That's right. Running, what a sport, nothing quite like it. We are on mile almost 10, we're almost done. But to be a part of your kidney fight, kidney awareness, we are honored. Hi guys, thanks so much for participating in the virtual run and walk, um, supporting the core kidney group. I, I'm Ravi Bojwani, part of the Circle of Core, and I've done this walk today uh, with my two babies.